Now celebrating our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1161 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The FCC is seeking comments on the current global semiconductor shortage and what impact it may have on its current initiatives. Amateur radio operators are gearing up for what promises to be a very active Atlantic hurricane season. CQ announces its 2021 Amateur Radio Hall of Fame inductees. We will introduce you to them. First-time applicants for an amateur radio license must now obtain an FCC registration number, better known as an FRN, before taking any exams. The spring ARRL section manager election results are announced. We'll bring them to you. High-frequency over-the-horizon radars continue to plague the low bands with interference. We will have the complete story. The Radio Amateurs of Canada invite worldwide participation in the upcoming Canada Day contest. The European Space Agency would like you to help them name their latest spacecraft. We will tell you how you can participate. A new amateur radio CubeSat will turn on an ultra-bright xenon lamp when you key it up. You will be able to see it on the ground. <laughs> we'll have all the details. And a radio amateur's recently discovered home movie of the Hindenburg disaster sparks a Nova PBS special. We'll bring you the story in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT on what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will compare the difference between analog and digital audio at a basic level and will tell us how we love our smartphones and how they are slowly becoming an enemy. Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLAV, will tell us how you can stream a dozen repeaters at the same time with an RTL SDR dongle. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill looks back to the days of control of electromagnetic radiation, better known as Conrad. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about what he perceives as an annual condition during the spring of each year called dead band syndrome. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, where three days ago it was 90 degrees, and today we almost had snow from rainy Albany, New York. I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting this week from the studios of the Museum of Science and Technology in Armory Square in Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from our amateur radio outpost in the Catskill Mountains of New York, where we prepare for the Memorial Day weekend by setting up a dozen flags today and soberly remembering the sacrifices of our fellow war veterans, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from a fully vaccinated Troy, New York News Bureau, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2. RJX. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where I'm glad I'm not getting Mother Nature's water bill this month, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with our lead story this week, here's Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Leading off the news this week, the Federal Communications Commission is seeking comment on the impact of the continuing global shortage of semiconductors. The FCC's May 11th public notice stated its concern is focused on the impact the shortage could have on the communications industry, agency initiatives, and the nation's continued advancement in the next generation technologies. FCC Acting Chairwoman Jessica rosen Worsell commented, The communications sector is one of the fastest growing segments of the semiconductor industry. These tiny pieces of technology are the basic building blocks of modern communications including 5G, 
Wi-Fi, satellites, and more. That is why we are seeking to better understand the current shortage, its consequences for the communications sector, and steps we can take to ensure that the FCC priorities and initiatives remain on track. Interested parties may file comments online using the FCC's electronic comment filing system. Initial comments are due on June 10th, and reply comments, which are comments on the comments, are due on June 25th. The Atlantic hurricane season, which starts on June 1st, promises to be a busy time for radio amateurs who volunteer on the Hurricane Watch Net to report ground-level storm conditions in real time for use by weather forecasters and for Skywarn volunteers. With more details on the upcoming Atlantic hurricane season and how amateurs are preparing, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters. NOAA just issued its forecast for the 2021 season. The outlook calls for a 70% probability in the following ranges. 13 to 20 named storms with top winds of at least 39 miles per hour. Of these 13 to 20 named storms, 6 to 10 will become hurricanes with top winds of at least 74 miles per hour. This includes three to five major hurricanes ranked as categories three, four, or five, with top winds of at least 111 miles per hour. Hurricane Watch Net Manager Bobby Graves, KB5HAV, said he's hoping we don't see a repeat of the 2005 or 2020 hurricane seasons. Graves said sea surface temperatures throughout normal areas of tropical cyclone activity are already near or just above 80 degrees Fahrenheit, just what storms like. As Graves said, it takes only one land-falling hurricane to make for a bad year. VOIP Hurricane Net Director of Operations Rob Macedo, KD1CY, said his organization is ready for another busy hurricane season. The National Hurricane Conference, June 14th through the 17th in New Orleans, will host its traditional amateur radio workshop on Tuesday, June 16th. Macedo will moderate the virtual session. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The current forecast for 2021 is on the high side. The adjusted average is 14 named storms, with 7 hurricanes and 3 of those at Category 3 or stronger. When activated, the Hurricane Watch Net operates on 14.325 MHz during daylight hours and on 7.268 MHz after dark. When required, however, the net will use both frequencies simultaneously. The NET's primary mission is to disseminate tropical cyclone advisory information to island communities in the Caribbean, Central America, along the U.S. Atlantic seaboard, and throughout Gulf of Mexico coastal areas. It collects observed or measured weather data from participating radio amateurs in storm-affected areas, as well as any post-storm damage reports, and passes that information along to forecasters at the National Hurricane Center via its amateur radio station WX4NHC. The Hurricane Watch Net typically activates whenever a storm system has achieved hurricane status and is within 300 statute miles of a populated landmass, although this can vary according to the storm's forward speed and intensity or at the request of NHS forecasters. The Hurricane Watch Net is already closely monitoring two systems, one near Bermuda and one in the western Gulf of Mexico. Now is the time for communities along the coastline as well as inland to get prepared for the dangers that hurricanes can bring, said Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo. The experts at NOAA are poised to deliver life-saving early warnings and forecasts to communities, which will also help minimize the economic impacts of storms. They also included a comparative table that shows predictions from Colorado State University, Tropical Storm Risk, and NOAA with the dates of their respective forecasts. Last year was a record-breaking hurricane season, observed NHC assistant WX4NHC coordinator Julio Ripoll, WD4R. We even got to use the Greek names all the way to IOTA. This season is predicted to be an above-average active season again. 
Ripoll noted that WX4NHC will conduct its annual station test on Saturday, May 29th from 1300 to 2100 UTC. This will be our 41st year of public service at National Hurricane Center, he said. The purpose of the weekend event is to test WX4NHC amateur radio operations and operators' home equipment, antennas, and computers prior to the June 1st start of the Atlantic hurricane season. This event is good practice for ham radio operators worldwide to practice amateur radio communications available during times of severe weather, Ripoll said. Participating stations will make brief contacts on various bands and modes to exchange signal reports and local weather conditions. The German Federal Network Agency, BNETS A, that's their regulator, has taken action against a make of solar panel optimizer that's been causing radio interference. The BNETS A reports in its official publication that a device from company Solar Edge does not comply with the EU Electromagnetic Compatibility Directive. The regulator said that the device does not comply with the EU-wide EU Declaration of Conformity and that the interference levels are too high. The regulator has therefore imposed a market-restricting measure in Germany on Solar Edge. The device in question for solar panel installations is a so-called optimizer, of which there are four non-compliant models from Solar Edge. Those who may be affected by this decision have four weeks to communicate their position on this to the regulator. The EU directive states that if Solar Edge's representative in Germany fails to take effective corrective action within the time limit stipulated, the regulator will take all appropriate interim measures to prevent the sale of those devices on the German market. They may fully prohibit or restrict the equipment or withdraw it from the market or physically recall it altogether. The German authorities are also immediately informing the EU Commission and the other member states of these measures. Veron, the Dutch National Amateur Radio Society, last week reported two articles on the results of EU electromagnetic compatibility studies on solar panels and LED lighting respectively. This showed, amongst other things, that 75% of the investigated solar panel systems and 25% of investigated LED lighting did not meet the emission requirements of the EU directive. In addition to technical requirements, the directive also prescribes administrative requirements, for example, with regard to the mandatory CE marking and the EU Declaration of Conformity. With its action on Solar Edge, the German regulator shows what the consequences of non-conformity can be. Incidentally, the imposed measure only applies to Germany, despite the fact that the applied directive is a European-wide one. Other EU member states therefore decide independently whether they want to take similar measures. Beginning May 20th, 2021, all amateur examination applicants will be required to provide an FCC registration number, or FRN, to the volunteer examiners. Before taking your exam, this is necessary due to changes the FCC has made to its licensing system. Amateur candidates who already have an FCC license, whether for amateur radio or in another service, already have an FRN and can use the same number. All prospective new FCC licensees, however, will be required to obtain an FRN before the exam and provide that number to the volunteer examiners on Form 605 of their license examination. An FCC instructional video provides step-by-step -step instructions on how to obtain an FRN through the FCC's Commission Registration System, or CORS, the FRN is required for all new applicants to take an amateur exam and used afterward by the applicant to download the license document from the FCC, upgrade the license, and apply for a vanity call sign, and to submit administrative updates such as your address and email changes and renewal applications. In addition, after June 29th, all applications will be required to contain an email address for FCC correspondence. Applicants will receive an email direct from the FCC with a link to official electronic copy of their license whenever a license is issued or changed. ARRLVEC suggests that those without access to email use the email address of a family member or friend. Licensees will be able to log into the ULS by using their FRN password to download the latest version of their license at any time. The FCC no longer provides paper licenses documents. In the only contested election this spring, 
Utah ARRL members elected Pat Mallon, N7PAT, as their new section manager for a two-year term commencing July 1st. Mallon of South Jordan received 419 votes, while incumbent Mel Parks, NM7P, garnered 339 votes. Parks had served as Utah section manager for 22 years. ARRL headquarters counted and verified the ballots on May 18th. In New Hampshire, Pete Storer, K1PJS of Concord, was the only nominee for section manager when nominations closed on March 4th. Storer, having previously served as section manager from 2013 until 2019, will succeed John Goddard, K1UAF, who decided not to seek a new term. Six incumbent section managers faced no opposition and were declared re-elected, effective July 1st. They are Marty Pittenger, KB3MXM in the Maryland, D.C. area, John Bigley, N7UR in Nevada, Bob Buse, W2OD in Northern New Jersey, Bob Odette, W1YRC in Rhode Island, John Litz, NZ6Q in San Joaquin Valley, and Dale Durham, W5WI in West Texas. Indiana amateurs are assisting in a sweeping search for a missing 12-year-old boy with autism, which ended with the discovery of his body in the Little Calumet River. Members of the Amateur Radio Association of Newton County, Indiana, were among the hundreds of volunteers aiding the search for Kieran Carter, the Missouri youth who was last seen on May 15th, leaving the Indiana Hotel where his family had been staying. Club president Mike Swader, KA9E, said that the hams provided VHF digital communications and GPS for the Northwest Indiana's canine search and rescue teams, serving as their communications branch. Working inside the association's mobile communications unit, the hams logged coordinates from the teams while they were deployed, providing digital tracking to help create a search map. Meanwhile, other searchers were deployed on foot, on horseback, by helicopter, and by boat, and were joined by the FBI and police from Indiana and nearby Illinois. On Monday, May 24th, the body of the little boy was found in the river and dive teams pulled him out. By then, Mike said, the Hams team had been demobilized because the nature of the search had changed. They learned of the boy's death through their liaison to local law enforcement. The South African Radio League reports the biggest headache for International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 monitoring service participants continues to be HF over-the-horizon radars. For more details on this story, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, from the Southgate Vibes Amateur Radio News. Already an interference issue for several years, HF radar activity seems to be multiplying exponentially. Most of the transmitters are located in China and Russia. In the April edition of the Monitoring Service Monthly Newsletter, coordinator Peter Yost, Hotel Bravo 9 Charlie Echo Tango, said that it's the same troublemakers every month. The over-the-horizon radars are by far the most troublesome source of interference. Monitoring reports from Europe and Africa show HF radar signals are littering the 20-meter phone band, with some also showing up as high as 15 meters, that's 21 megahertz, as well as down to 40 meters, that's 7 megahertz, or even lower. These include the infamous foghorn over the horizon radar, so called because of the sound it makes with its approximately 10 kilohertz wide transmission, mostly in short bursts. The Russian container radar has also been spotted on 20 meters and elsewhere, generating an approximately 12 kHz bandwidth signal. HB9CET commented that what is always surprising is how strongly intruders from the Far East can be heard in IARU Region 1, sometimes even during the day in the 40 meter band. For example, a 160 kHz wideband radar, as well as foghorn and similar. A newcomer of sorts has been the Super Dual Auroral Radar Network, SuperDAN. It's an HF radar signal, but it's causing interference to radio amateurs on 14.210 MHz and possibly elsewhere. The system is actually fully recognized. The SuperDAN system is an international scientific radar network consisting of 35 HF radars in both the northern and southern hemispheres. These radars are primarily used to map high-latitude plasma convection in the F region of the ionosphere, but they're also used to study a wider range of geospace phenomena, including geomagnetic storms. 
Super Darn Network radars look into Earth's upper atmosphere and operate continuously to observe the motion of charged particle plasma in the ionosphere and other effects that provide scientists with information on Earth's space environment. Knowledge gained from this work provides insight into space weather hazards, including radiation exposure from high-altitude travelers and disruptions to communication networks, navigation systems, and electrical power grids. CQ has announced six new members to its Amateur Radio Hall of Fame and two new members each to the DX Hall of Fame and the Contest Hall of Fame. This year's inductions were conducted online due to event cancellations resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. Here to introduce us to this year's CQ Amateur Radio Hall of Fame inductees, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, who files this report courtesy of the Southgate Vibes Amateur News Service in the UK. The CQ Amateur Radio Hall of Fame honours those individuals, whether licensed hams or not, who've made significant contributions to amateur radio, and those amateurs who've made significant contributions either to amateur radio, to their professional careers, or to some other aspect of life on our planet. The six new members brings to 339 the total number of members inducted since the Hall's establishment in 2001. The 2021 inductees are Archibald Doty, Whiskey 7 Alpha Charlie Delta, sadly no longer with us, an engineer, inventor and researcher into efficient radial systems for vertical antennas. He was also a pioneer of college radio and served as a pilot in World War II. Nathan Al Frissel, Whiskey 2 November Alpha Foxtrot, is the founder of HAM SCI, the HAM Radio Science Citizen Investigation, a collaboration between radio amateurs and ionospheric scientists. He organised the 2017 Solar Eclipse QSO Party, which also served as a research project on the effects of a total solar eclipse on HF propagation. Lauren Hollander, Whiskey Alpha One Papa Golf Bravo, is a world-renowned classical concert pianist who has performed with virtually every major philharmonic orchestra in the United States, along with many others overseas. He's heavily involved in music and arts education and in relationships between music and medicine. Christopher Imlay, Whiskey 3 Kilo Delta, served on the ARRL Council and General Council from 1982 to 2018, representing the league with the FCC, that's the American regulator, on a wide variety of issues. Closer to home, Catherine Mitchell, Mike Zero India Bravo Golf, is Academic Director of the University of Bath Doctoral College in the UK and was the recipient of the 2019 Edward Appleton Medal for pioneering research in tomography and data assimilation, revealing a completely new perspective on Earth's ionosphere in response to extreme space weather. And Admiral Charles Richard, Whiskey 4 Hotel Foxtrot Zulu, is a commander in the United States Strategic Command. He previously served as commander of U.S. submarine forces and director of undersea warfare at the Pentagon. The CQDX Hall of Fame honours those amateurs who not only excel in personal performance in this major area of amateur radio, but who also give back to the hobby in outstanding ways. It was established in 1967 to recognise those amateurs who've made major contributions to DXing and de-expeditioning. The 2021 new inductees are Jackie Calvo, Zulu Lima 3 Charlie Whiskey, also Foxtrot 2 Charlie Whiskey. He's a veteran of the French Air Force and the International Committee of the Red Cross, with postings that took him and his ham radio station to dozens of countries around the world. He was a participant in more than two dozen de-expeditions and World Radio Sport Team Championship competitions from 2010 to 2018, and he's a team leader for 2022. Francesco Valsecchi, India Kilo Zero Foxtrot Victor Charlie, has regularly activated Vatican City for the past 30 years using Hotel Victor Zero Alpha and other call signs, as well as the Sovereign Military Order of Malta region using One Alpha Zero Kilo Mike. Along with fellow operators, Francesco has logged more than 300,000 QSOs from the two tiny entities, averaging roughly 10,000 contacts per year for hams around the world. The CQ Contest Hall of Fame was established in 1986 to recognise those amateurs who've made major contributions to the art of radio contesting. 
The two 2021 inductees are Robert Walbert, Kilo 6 X-Ray X-Ray, who's described as a renaissance man of contesting, advancing the state of the art in designing amateur radio equipment at Ellicraft. He's been a participant in more than 1,100 contests over 35 years and a many-time winner. He's authored many articles for amateur contesting publications and has given presentations at many conferences. David Pruitt, Kilo 8 Charlie Charlie, sadly now a silent key, was the author of the NA Contest Logging Program as well as a Log Checking Program, and he hosted many multi-operator contest activities from his Michigan station over 30 years. Formal inductions to the CQ Contest and DX Halls of Fame have been conducted online again this year as a result of the COVID-19 related cancellations of the Dayton Hamvention and associated contest and DX dinners. CQ Worldwide DX Contest Director John Doerr, K1AR, led the Contest Hall of Fame induction at the conclusion of Contest University's online seminar on May 20th, while CQ DX Editor Bob Schenk N2OO led the DX Hall of Fame induction on May 26th during the Ham Nation podcast on the Ham Radio Crash Course YouTube channel. Ham SCI is looking for ham radio operators to make recordings of the time standard stations during the June 2021 annular solar eclipse across the Arctic Circle as part of a citizen science experiment. With more details on how you can participate in this experiment, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, with this report. Researchers will use the crowdsourced data to investigate the superimposed effects of auroral particle precipitation and the eclipse on HF Doppler shift. Participants would collect data using an HF radio connected to a computer running open source software a precision frequency standard such as a GPS disciplined oscillator is desirable but not required. Radio amateurs and shortwave listeners around the globe are invited to take part, even stations far from the path of totality. Last year's Eclipse festivals included more than 100 participants from 45 countries. The experiment, June 7th through the 12th, is a pilot experiment for Hamsai's Personal Space Weather Station project, which seeks to develop a global network monitoring the geospace environment. The eclipse will be an unusual annular or ring of fire eclipse. This occurs when the moon is too far from Earth to fully block the sun, but will fit entirely within it. The eclipse path will cross over the North Pole. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. For more information and set up instructions, visit the June 2021 Arctic Eclipse Festival page on the HAM SCI website at ham.sci.org. That's www.hamsci.org. Here's a chance to enjoy an operating event that is not on a weekend. Help Canada celebrate its birthday on the air during the Radio Amateurs of Canada Canada Day contest on Thursday, July 1st, just a few days ahead of Independence Day in the U.S. Canada Day is the anniversary of Canada's Confederation, when the three colonies of Canada, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick united into the Dominion Canada on July 1st, 1867. The RAC Contest Committee is asking all participants in the 2021 Canada Day contest to follow guidelines provided by the government and by health officials in their respective areas for any multi-op categories. The Canada Day contest begins on July 1st, 0000 UTC. That's the evening of Wednesday, June 30th in North America time zones and continues through 2359 UTC. Bands include 160, 80, 40, 20, 15, 10, 6 and 2 meters, CW and phone using single sideband, FM, AM, etc. Stations in Canada send signal reports plus the province or territory. VE zeros and stations outside Canada send a signal report and a serial number. Contacts with stations in Canada or VE zeros are worth 10 points. Contacts with stations outside of Canada are worth 2 points. And contacts with RAC official stations will have RAC as the suffix are worth 20 points. Stations may be worked once on each mode on each of the available bands. CW contacts and conventional phone subbands are not allowed, nor are phone contacts and conventional CW subbands. 
Canada's 10 provinces and three territories serve as multipliers for the event. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Whoosh! Coming at you over to radio and the internet. The sound coming to my microphone is analog. This microphone goes into a mixer. The mixer goes into a digital box, which converts it to ones and zeros. And from there, there's no more analog until, in the case of this, it gets to the radio. You know, it goes through the air in an analog fashion, and your speakers are analog. Now, with television nowadays, no, it's once it's bits. Once it goes into that camera, and it's converted to ones and zeros, it's ones and zeros the rest of the way, all the way down, even into your TV set. That's, the, that's really the revolution that we're talking about here, the ones and zeros revolution. But we don't, we don't want anal no more analog, all digital. Sometimes when I'm giving uh, speeches, I'll bring along with me a vacuum tube. Have you ever seen one of those? You old timers, people not my age, remember vacuum tubes. In fact, some of you audiophiles not only remember them, have them still, because there's people out there, you know, you've met the person who says, oh, CD sound, that's terrible, that's not. Real, it was real when we had vinyl. Now that was music, because that was analog, wasn't it? And those, and some of those people, a subset of them, are even say, and by the way, those digital amplifiers, the ones with chips in them, no, you got to have vacuum tubes for that warm sound, that analog sound. Those people are listening to analog all the way. It's kind of amazing to think about it. It was only recently, this, and my kids are going to not remember this, but it was only within the last few decades that we went from completely analog music to completely, almost completely digital music. So nowadays when a, a musician comes into the studio, the, the mic is still an analog mic, pretty much, you know, the same design that Thomas Edison conceived of, where the, the sound waves, the compression waves from the voice go into the microphone, and then the microphone converts those into electrical signals, still analog, goes down the cable and those electrical signals, but in the modern recording studio, as soon as it hits the soundboard, boom, it's turned into bits. And it stays bits all the way until it comes out of your iPod into a speaker or your headphones, which are the are analog devices, which reproduce those sound waves. You know, the, the sound pressure created by the singer's voice vibrated that diaphragm in the microphone. That was turned to ones and zeros all the way through the iTunes music store into your iPod, which then sends out an electrical signal. It's an analog signal, and it causes the diaphragm on your headphones to vibrate the same way the diaphragm on the microphone vibrated and reproduces it. And, and, so, so we're still, you know, our ears are still analog, just as our vocal cords are still analog. Our instruments, in many cases, not all, are still analog. If you're using a synthesizer, that's digital. So in, in the, uh, in, in, until very recently, it was all analog. Those sound pressure waves that were made on the microphone were turned into electrical signals, which were sent down. And this is very amazing this even worked. Essentially to a needle that vibrated and in vibrating, cut grooves into the vinyl. Okay, I'm simplifying a little bit, but that essentially that's what happened. Those grooves then are replicate, you know, are, are basically a recording of the sound pressure waves. Grandma and grandpa used to do this, kids. They'd go to the record store and they'd buy a big piece of plastic that had a groove, one groove, all the way from the outside edge to the center of the big piece of plastic. That big piece of plastic that groove, if you looked at it with a microscope, was looked like little vibrations. It looked like just, you know, <laughs> so we, we'd take that home and we'd put it on a thing that would turn at the same speed as the machine that was recording from the microphone was turning. And then we'd put a needle in it, very much like the needle that was used to cut those grooves. And that needle would be vibrated by the grooves. <laughs> and it would turn the vibrations into electrical impulses or be sent to an amplifier where vacuum tubes would be used to increase the sound pressure of it and 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 then would come out of our speakers at no point at that with those vinyl records was it ever digital it was all analog all the way is digital an improvement well you know you talk to those people with those magical golden ears they're going to say no 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 the, you, you because you know if you think about it what we have to do to make these ones and zeros we have to take some information out analog now there are all sorts of imperfections that get introduced by the microphone and the and the needle and the vinyl and the mastering and all that stuff and even scratches and pops and clicks that get introduced on the record. But those imperfections, say these golden-eared folks, are minor compared to what you're doing when you digitize the music and you're tearing the guts out of it. 
fact, there's, there are even psychologists who study this who say digital music doesn't move the soul, the spirit, in the same way analog music does because there's something intangible missing. I don't know if I could, I don't, I don't know if we could prove this. There's something intangible missing because in order to convert it to ones and zeros, we have to sample it. That's the process of taking small bits of that music, making a measurement of its frequency, and recording it as, as ones and zeros. So instead of a smooth waveform that's created by an analog sound, that sound pressure wave coming from my voice, if you look at it closely, you get a jaggy waveform because we can't record an infinite number of steps. We can only record, well, if it's 16-bit, we can only record 65,000 steps. So that's a, a, a CD, CD, so-called CD quality sound, is sampled 44,100 times a second. They measure the frequency. They take a slice of the frequency, and they represent that frequency as a 16-bit number, a number from 0 to 65,000. And they do that 44,000 times a second. Well, they miss a little bit. I mean, of course, inevitably, the point of the digital audio engineers say, well, you miss a little bit, but you don't miss as much as the ear misses. It's not the ear smooths it all together. In the same way that a movie at 24 frames a second clearly misses a lot, whatever happens in between those frames, but our eyes mush it all together and it looks like smooth flowing motion. But this transformation is huge. I mean, this is what, this is what we talk about on the show because when we took these analog sounds, which couldn't very easily be transported, you had to move this vinyl record around or you had to you know, kind of figure out a way to send it through the airwaves. It, it, was, it was kind of a primitive system. When you turn it into ones and zeros, there's a few things you can do with it. You can reproduce it an infinite number of times without any loss of quality. That's number one, perfect copies. Number two, you can transmit it around the globe at the speed of light. That's, that's number two. Those are two very big changes. Suddenly, in fact, we saw it. That's what happened in the music industry, isn't it? In fact, that's what scares the record industry terribly, is you can make perfect copies of those songs as MP3s and transmit them <laughs> across the internet at the speed of light. But it's also what's fueled the digital revolution. There's a third thing that happens too, by the way, because it's, you know, you've got easy copying and easy transmission, but you also have, it makes it easier to modify because now you've got it ones and zeros. You can take that photograph perhaps and, and use Photoshop to change it or the music and use GarageBand to modify it or, or, or the movie and, 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 and use a, a, a video editing movie maker to, to modify it or edit it. Those things become much more easily done by a computer because it's digital, because it's ones and zeros. You know, old days of movies, they had to use, they would wear white cotton gloves and, they, and they'd and they use razors and scissors to cut the film and glue to paste it back together. That's how you edit it. So, so we gain something by these ones and zeros. And it's a pretty, and it's pretty amazing. It's really what this digital revolution is. This is really what the show is all about is what happens when you take pictures, movies, music, and you convert them into bits how the world transforms, how the world changes. Uh, let's see, what else can we talk about? We love our smartphones, right? I mean, it's an amazing thing. It's a, a, I mean, if you told me about this 20 years ago, I said, wow, the future. An always on internet device works anywhere. As you wander around, you're always connected to the internet. So there's no question you can't get an answer to. You can always see where you are on a map. Just that by itself. You can always see where you are on a map. You can't get lost anymore. That's amazing. Mind blown. It has a camera. And in fact, modern, most modern phones these days, we're going to see the new Google phone in, on Tuesday. Uh, it should have an amazing camera. The new iPhone, absolutely. I mean, camera as good as any point and shoot better, really, because of all the computational capability. It is a supercomputer in your pocket. It has more power than one of those big Cray supercomputers of 10 years ago. I mean, I can go on and on. It's got an amazing display, brilliant, bright color display. You can see pictures of your kids anytime. Much better than the old wallet photo. You always know exactly what time it is. I mean, I can go on and on. But this wonderful toy in our pocket, eh, it's really more than a toy. You practically can't live without it these days is also a little bit of an enemy in our pocket. And that's the thing that's getting a little weird. I talked last hour about how the China is putting a strongly encouraging, in, in a way the only the Chinese government can, uh, Chinese citizens to put a, a educational app on their phone that in, in, in effect spies on them, completely spies on them. You know, it gives, gives the authorities every bit of information that's on the phone, 
or that the phone can find out, including the microphone, the camera, the GPS, everything. And sure, if you're a totalitarian government, what a great way to control the populace. I mean, this is 1984. Remember the telescreens in 1984 that were watching you while you watched them? This is so much better because you're carrying it around with you in your pocket. So it's starting to be that this friendly little pocket pal has also become a little bit of the enemy. We're worried about Facebook and other companies using it to spy on us. This is not for your benefit. Oh, yeah, they paint it that way. Well, don't you always want to know what the weather's like? <laughs> if you're going to need an umbrella, don't you want to know every financial traction, transaction? And maybe you do. But there's, I guarantee you, on any phone, many, many notifications for things you couldn't care less about. It's a public safety thing, too, right? When we had the power outages and the wildfires, there's a service. Uh, I think it's available in most of the country called Nixle. Do you have that on your phone? I, after the fires two years ago, of course, I've got it on my phone. And that's the way the law, law enforcement, sheriff's office, police, fire department, emergency services can get to you. can say, hey, watch out. But they got to be careful because they can overdo it and they can make you want to turn it off because, you know, they can't tell me everything that's going on. <laughs> Pretty soon your life is filled with jangly pop-ups from all sorts of places. It's really, I think, a good piece of advice when you get a new phone to go through and turn off notifications for stuff you don't care about. And I have to give Apple some credit because they have made it a little bit easier. If you have iOS 13 or maybe even 12, but certainly in the newest versions of iOS. If, you, if you're looking at a notification, you say, I don't want to hear from that program ever again. You could just put your finger on it, slide it. You got to slide it almost all the way to the edge and you'll see a couple of things pop up, clear all view and hidden deep within so that you'll probably never notice it is a button that says manage. And when you get to that manage, you can pop up a window that says turn off all notifications. Don't bug me, baby. That's what they should say. They should say, don't bug me ever again. The phones that I use when I'm doing the radio show, go in the settings, the little gear icon, and both, both Android and iOS have this, a do not disturb feature. It silences calls and notifications. Nothing will annoy you. Now, I have it, normally we have it set you know, when we go to bed and when we get up so it doesn't bother you at night. But on the phones I have in studio with me, I almost always set it for the show times as well because I don't want to be bugged. I don't want the phone to ring during the shows or pop up things or whatever. Go into settings, tap that do not disturb and, and turn it on. After a while, I thought about it. I said, I don't, I guess I don't really need to be disturbed ever. <laughs> Depends on how curmudgeonly you want to be. But you could turn that on from 11.59 a.m. till noon p.m. No, no, let's see. What would you do? You'd turn it on from 12.01 p.m. to 12 p.m. So there'd be one minute <laughs> in the in, in, at noon when all the notifications could come in. You can't turn it off. You can't say forever. You have to have allow, I think you have to allow at least one minute. <laughs> but really, this is, this is, the, an interesting problem that the phone is both our little plastic pal that's fun to be with and the enemy in our pocket. But the good news is I think you can tame it unless you're a citizen of the Chinese government's uh, got an app on your phone. There's not much you can do at that point. You just kind of got to go along to get along. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high-tech Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. The Radio Society of Great Britain has designated ARRL authors Jack Purdom, W8TEE, -E, and Al Peter, AC8GY, as winners of the 2020 Bennett Prize G8PF for their article, Double Double Magnetic Loop, published in the February 2020 edition of RADCOM. The award recognizes any significant contribution or innovation which furthers the art of radio communications. Radio Club Argentino, Argentina's IARU member society, is celebrating its 100th anniversary. 
The Radio Club Argentino Awards Committee says special call sign L21RCA will be on the air throughout the year, operating from various provinces. Various downloadable certificates are available. Visit the Radio Club Argentino Centennial website for more information. The Southwest Ohio DX Association has named the VP8PJ South Orkney Island DXpedition as its 2021 DXpedition of the Year. The award recognizes excellence in planning and execution from most wanted DXCC entities. Winners of the DXpedition of the Year Award have overcome significant access, licensing, and logistical challenges to deliver a large number of contacts to a broad swath of the global amateur community, the Southwest Ohio DX Association said in announcing the award. They represent the pinnacle of DXpeditioning. CW Ops has designated the K1 USN Radio Club as the 2021 recipient of its award for advancing the art of CW. As CW Ops noted in making the announcement, the K1 USN Radio Club has created and managed the K1 USN Weekly Slow Speed Test that provides a place for new and unpracticed CW operators to gather and operate at relaxed speeds in a friendly and encouraging manner that helps them continue to improve their CW skills. Welcome to the Ancient Amateur Archives. I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY. Picture the following scenario in a slightly grainy black and white for added effect. It's the 1950s. A ham is sitting at his station, having a CW CUSO. He's wearing a suit and tie. Before him is a Hammerlin receiver, a Johnson Viking transmitter, and a homebrew modulator. On the wall are QSL cards and his honorable discharge certificate. On the table is a collection of QST magazines along with some curious pamphlets with titles such as Protect Them, Join Civil Defense, Take Your Place in Civil Defense, It Can Happen Here, Know the Signals, and even a comic book featuring a character called Bert the Turtle. While the Vibroplex clicks away, another radio sits in the background quietly spitting out atmospheric noise. It's an AM broadcast receiver one of those five-tube ACDC models produced by the millions. This unit, an Arvin in an Art Deco plastic cabinet, is tuned to one of two triangular markings on the dial. Suddenly the silence is shattered by a piercing 1,000 cycle tone. The ham looks up, rips off his headphones, and listens to a message. Colorado Rad Channel. This is a Class 1 emergency. All civilian traffic is barred from streets and highways. Stay in your homes. Stay in your homes. He jumps from the chair, runs to the door and yells to his wife, Grab the kids and go down to the fallout shelter. The Conrad alarm just went off. Know what Conrad means? It stands for Control of Electromagnetic Radiation. Sounds pretty complicated if you're not an electronic engineer. And yet all you have to do is dial your AM radio to 640 or 1240 in the event of an enemy air attack. And thanks to Conrad, you will continue to receive official information. Remember, in times of civil defense emergency, for official news and civil defense instructions, dial Conrad at 640 or 1240 on your AM standard radio. Conrad, which stood for Control of Electromagnetic Radiations, had its embryonic start in December 1951 when President Harry Truman signed an executive order directing the FCC to set up a security system for all civilian radio services. Throughout 1952, Conrad was developed and tested, and by early 1953, it was ready. The purpose of Conrad was to relay civil defense information to the public without allowing enemy aircraft to use our radio signals as a beacon for their direction-finding equipment. This is Dennis James. Here is a message about Conrad from Leo A. Hoig, Director of the Office of Civil and Defense Mobilization. Radio beams can help guide enemy planes or missiles to their target. Yet during a war, information would be urgently needed by the public. This is the reason for Conrad. 
When Conrad goes into effect, all radio and television stations will sign off the air. In a few minutes, the Conrad radio stations will return to the air over either 640 or 1240. In case of attack, all other stations will be off the air. You will not be able to get information over your telephone. Only Conrad at these frequencies, 640 or 1240, on your radio will give you official information and instructions. In the event of an emergency, all FM, TV, and most AM stations would proceed with the following alarm sequence. First, current programming would be discontinued. Then, five seconds, the carrier was off the air. Followed by, five seconds, an unmodulated carrier. Then, five seconds, carrier off the air. Followed by, 15 seconds of a 1,000 cycle modulated carrier, then a one minute maximum initial Conrad message, and finally the carrier off the air for the duration of the alert. The remaining AM stations would shift to either 640 or 1240 kilocycles and simultaneously broadcast a more detailed emergency message. The stations would constantly turn their carriers on and off. For example, Station A, operating on 640 kilocycles, would broadcast the emergency message for 15 seconds and suddenly cut its carrier. The public would then hear Station B, also on 640 kilocycles, with the same message. When Station B went silent, Station C would appear and, after a few seconds, Station A would be back on the air. This cluster pattern would continue until the emergency message had been broadcast. The same activity would be happening on 1240 kilocycles. No call signs or other ID would be given. In this way, the FCC and the Office of Civil Defense hope to confuse enemy aircraft trying to use AM radio stations as a homing beacon. The ARRL and the FCC realize that amateur stations might also serve as a beacon. Therefore, from the beginning, amateurs were urged to keep watch on 640 or 1240 kilocycles and to kill their transmitters when the alarm was given. With the importance of Conrad in the early 1950s, it's surprising that amateurs were not required to monitor for the Conrad alarm. This was rectified on January 2nd, 1957, when the FCC amended Part 12 of the Rules and Regulations to require the following. All operators of stations in the amateur radio service will be responsible for the reception of the Conrad radio alert by monitoring 640 or 1240 kilocycles. During a Conrad radio alert, all operators of amateur radio stations will cease communications immediately. Stations operating under the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service, RACES, and other stations specifically authorized would be allowed to remain on the air under the following conditions. No transmission would be made unless it is of extreme emergency affecting the national safety or the safety of life and property. Transmissions would be as short as possible. No station identification or location would be given. Tactical calls would be utilized if necessary and the radio station carrier would be discontinued during periods of no message transmission. Amateur stations were not allowed back on the air until the Conrad radio all clear message was transmitted. With the requirement of continuous broadcast band monitoring, homebrew projects, kits, and commercial products began to appear to help the amateur keep in compliance with Part 12-190. While some amateurs simply used a simple AM radio, Others bought or built specific Conrad receivers. Heathkit had the CA-1 Conrad alarm. Morrow Radio had the CM-1 Conrad monitor. And the Walter Ash Radio Company had the model CA Conal alarm. Radio Shack's first transistor radio, which sold for a mere $29.95 and $1958, was advertised as perfect for monitoring Conrad. When Class D CB radio was authorized in September of 1958, the rules specified that CBers also had to monitor Conrad. In the event of an emergency, all citizen band operators had to leave the air. There were no races provisions for them. By the early 1960s, the possibility of long-range enemy bombers homing in on our radio signals was becoming remote. 
Instead, intercontinental ballistic missiles were the new threat. They didn't require our broadcast signals as beacons. Conrad was becoming obsolete. Thus, in the autumn of 1962, Conrad was replaced by the emergency broadcast system. Ironically, Conrad disappeared right around the time it might have been needed the most, the Cuban Missile Crisis. As the 1960s wore on, the Cold War gradually disappeared and the specter of imminent enemy attack disappeared. Today, only the faded fallout shelter signs and those triangular markings on old AM radios remain to remind us of Connell Rad and the Cold War. As I write this, I can hear a Springfield, Massachusetts station on 640 kilohertz, while a heterodyne of class 4 stations co-mingles on 1240. And yet, what is that I hear faintly in the background? A 1,000 cycle tone? Your time is up. Go in peace. But return again for our next installment of the Ancient Amateur Archives. It's time for the weekly propagation forecast report. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that the 10.7 centimeter solar flux rose this week. And on Wednesday, May 26th, it reached 88, the highest it's been since December 7th, 2020, when it was 89.5. The very next day at 2300 UTC, the solar flux value was 94.2. The official solar flux value is always the local noon reading at Canada's Dominion Radio Astrophysical Research Facility in Pendington, British Columbia, 177 miles northeast of Seattle. Readings are available three times a day. Average daily solar flux rose this week to 77.8 from last week's average of 74.2, while the average daily sunspot number increased from 20.3 to 24.9. We hope that this signals a return to the enhanced activity and HF conditions that we saw at the end of 2020, with the resumption of solar cycle 25's upward climb. So looking ahead, the predicted solar flux over the next few days is 83, 81, 80, and 76 on May 28th through the 31st, 72 on June 1st through the 3rd, 73 on June 4th, 74 on June 5th through the 10th, 75 on June 11th, and 77 on June 12th through the 15th. The predicted A index is 10, 5, 8, 5, and 8 on May 28th through June 1st, and then 5 on June 2nd and beyond, possibly all the way into mid-July. Time now for the AMSAT report. AMSAT's Bruce Page, KK5DO, asks, Have you ever wanted your own working satellite? What about a satellite to demonstrate at a school, ham fest, or special event? The next best thing, he says, is the AMSAT CubeSat simulator. This is a fully working model that is low cost and includes solar panels, batteries, transmits UHF radio telemetry, and has a 3D printed frame. The circuit boards are available at the AMSAT online store along with a bill of materials. You get a board, a main board, battery board and stem payload board. This is a great project, Bruce says. Add a rotating table and a light to simulate the sun and you can have a lot of fun watching the telemetry as it changes. Questions? Contact Alan, KU2Y, AMSAT's Vice President of Education at KU2Y at AMSAT.org. The AMSAT report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. NASA has selected a CubeSat that, when in orbit, can be commanded by anyone with an amateur radio license and a ham radio to set off a xenon flash from a spacecraft that will be visible from the ground. Roughly the size of a toaster, the 1U CubeSat, named LightCube, was designed, built, and tested by an interdisciplinary team of students, advisors, and engineers across a multiple organization at the Arizona State University. It's scheduled to head to the International Space Station as an auxiliary payload aboard a rocket launching between 2022 and 2025. Once deployed, the CubeSat will respond with a flash using an onboard xenon flash tube that will be visible to the naked eye of the commander. The public will be able to track the LightCube satellite using an app 
and then transmit to the satellite with a ham radio. Once the signal has been received, they will see a flash from the satellite in the night sky, said Principal Investigator Jaime Sanchez de la Vega of Vega Space Systems. According to the CubeSat's website, its mission objective is to produce a light visible to the naked eye on observers on Earth, as well as aiming to inspire and provide a learning experience to people across planet Earth. This is an education-based mission, said Danny Jacobs, assistant professor at ASU's School of Earth and Space Exploration, and the initiative's associate director. Our goal in building and launching a spacecraft that can be commanded by the public is to inspire everyone to learn about telecommunications, spacecraft design, atmospheric and climate science, and orbital mechanics. The spacecraft will include a UHF antenna led by the CETY's Universidad team, in Baja, California, Mexico, xenon flash tubes, solar panels, an onboard computer, transceiver, and a deployable gravity gradient boom that orients the light towards the Earth. Last Saturday, the 22nd of May, the Sun produced a sequence of solar flares unlike anything we've seen in years. Earth-orbiting satellites detected a dozen explosions in the magnetic canopy of Sunspot AR2824. In only 24 hours, NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory recorded 10 C-class flares and two M-class flares. The rapid-fire explosions hurled multiple overlapping coronal mass ejections into space. One of them emitted a radio burst so strong it drowned out static from lightning storms on Earth and was recorded by listening stations in the Arctic. According to NOAA models, a combined coronal mass ejection will hit Earth's magnetic field during the late hours of May the 25th, potentially sparking G2-class geomagnetic storms on May the 26th. As always, the full story can be read at spaceweather.com, and you can sign up there to receive Aurora alerts via SMS text. Foundations of Amateur Radio A while ago, as part of my ongoing exploration into all things radio, I came across a utility called RTL SDR Airband. It's a tool that uses a cheap software-defined radio dongle to listen to a station frequency or channel and send it to a variety of different outputs. Originally written by Tony Wong in 2014, it's since been updated and is now maintained by Thomas Limich. There are contributions by a dozen other developers. The original examples are based around listening to air traffic control channels. I know of a local amateur who uses it to listen to and share the local emergency service communication channels, especially important during local bushfires. While sophisticated, it's a pretty simple tool to use. Runs on a Raspberry Pi, or in my case inside a Docker container. It's well documented, has instructions on how to compile it and how to configure it. Before I get into what I've done, as a test, let's have a look at the kinds of things that RTL SDR Airband can do. First of all, it's intended to be used for AM, but if you read the fine documentation, you'll learn that you can also make it support narrowband FM. It can generate output in a variety of different ways, from a normal audio file to an IQ file. More about that at another time. And it can also send audio as a stream to a service like Icecast, Broadcastify, or even to your local Pulse audio server. If that last one doesn't mean much to you, it's a local network audio service, popular under Linux, but it runs on pretty much anything else, thanks to the community efforts of many. So, on the face of it, you can listen to a channel, be it AM or narrowband FM, and send that to some output. But I wouldn't spend anywhere as much time on this if that was all there was to it. The software can also dynamically change channels, support multiple dongles, or simultaneously listen to several channels at once, and output each of those wherever you desire. Another interesting thing, and ultimately the reason I thought to discuss it here, is that RTL SDR Airband also supports the concept of a mixer. You can send multiple channels to a single mixer and output the result somewhere else. Using a mixer, in addition to setting cutoff frequencies and other audio attributes, you can set the audio balance for each individual channel. This means that you can mix a channel exclusively to the left ear, or to the right ear, or both, or somewhere in between. Now to add one extra little bit of information. In my location there's about a dozen or so amateur repeaters, most of which can be heard at some time or another from my QTH. The frequency spread of those dozen repeaters is less than 2 MHz. A cheap RTL SDR dongle can handle about 2.56 MHz. 
Perhaps you've not yet had the aha moment, but what if you were to define an RTL SDR airband receiver that listened to a dozen amateur radio repeaters at the same time, and using the audio balance, spread those repeaters between your left and right ear. You could stream that somewhere and listen to it. I'm sitting here with my headphones on, listening to the various repeaters do their idents. Various discussions on different repeaters, a local beacon, incoming all-star and other links, all spread out across my audio horizon. Almost as if you can see where they are on the escarpment, though, truth be told, I've just spaced them out evenly, but you get the idea. My original Raspberry Pi wasn't quite powerful enough to do this the brute force way that I've configured this, so as a proof of concept I'm running it on my main computer. But there's nothing to suggest that doing a little diligent tweaking won't make my Pi more than enough to make this happen. As for audio bandwidth, it's a single audio stream, so a dial-up connection to the internet should be sufficient to get the audio out to the world. I will point out that there may be legal implications with streaming your local amateur repeaters to the world, so don't do that without checking. For my efforts, this is an example of, I wonder if. As it turns out, yes you can. As it happens, my next challenge is to use this code on a Pluto SDR, where the bandwidth is slightly larger. Mind you, I'll have to do some fancy footwork to process the data without overwhelming the CPU, but that's another experiment in my future. What kind of crazy stuff have you tried that worked? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Nothing may be new under the sun, but something new will soon be out in space keeping a vigilant eye on solar activity. The European Space Agency is designing a solar storm hunting spacecraft that can spot eruptions known as coronal mass ejections before they reach the Earth. When the spacecraft detects danger, it will transmit an alert that allows us to prepare for what's to come here on Earth. The European Space Agency is calling the spacecraft the world's first mission to provide solar warning. But for now, that's all the agency is able to call it because the craft doesn't have a name. Not yet, anyway. That's where the rest of us can step in. The ESA wants us to help name the spacecraft, which will join us in watching sunspots form and will track propagation of solar events before the end of the decade. Use the ESA website to enter the name of your choice. You have until 17th of October. Just bear in mind that you can't submit names that have already been used for other missions. Here is this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars, a members only benefit. To register, check on upcoming webinars and view previously recorded sessions. Please visit the ARRL webinar page. Ask the Lab how ARRL's Technical Information Service can help you. Hosted by ARRL Laboratory Manager Ed Hare, W1RFI will be presented on Tuesday, June 8th at 1 p.m. Eastern, that's 1700 UTC. Learn about the ARRL Technical Information Service and the expert ARRL laboratory staff who answer thousands of questions each year from members. Get tips about projects, suggestions to address various station installations, and help for some of your more pressing ham radio questions. You'll discover how to search ARRL's extensive periodicals archive, find helpful articles, read test reports, access technical forms, and find answers to technical questions beyond the lab. Improving Your Club's 2021 Field Day Score, hosted by Paul Bork, N1SFE, ARRL Contest Program Manager, will be held on Thursday, June 10th at 8 p.m. Eastern, that's 0 UTC on Friday, June 11th. Learn how your club or group can take advantage of the 2021 ARRL Field Day Rules Waivers while operating as Class D or E from home. We'll discuss how individuals or groups can boost their scores by earning bonus points, review how to use the Field Day web applet to submit your score, and go over how to attribute your score to your club's aggregate score. This presentation highlights all you need to know to operate as a group for ARRL Field Day 2021. Introduction to Remote HF Operation, hosted by David Lemfranconi, W6DGE, and Kevin Schinwheeler, N7KSW, from the Cal Poly Amateur Radio Club, will be presented on Tuesday, June 22nd at 1 p.m. Eastern, that's 1700 UTC. Then Franconi and Shin Wheeler will discuss the idea, process, and challenges encountered while getting their club's remote HF station on the air, as well as some methods and resources available for those with a similar interest. A question and answer session and live demo are included. 
ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded learning network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. Please remember that webinars are an ARRL members only benefit. Please check the ARRL Learning Network webpage for the most up-to-date information on webinar presentations and any changes that may occur to the schedule. Renowned physicist, astronomer, and past Arecibo Observatory Director Gordon Pettengill, W1OUN, of Concord, Massachusetts, died on May 8th. An ARRL member, he was 95. He was instrumental as Arecibo Observatory Director in getting some telescope time at that facility for hams to do EME moon bounce on 432 MHz, giving a lot of hams with modest stations a shot at making a QSO via moon reflection, said Chip Taylor, W1AIM. He was the first person to use that big dish to do radar mapping of the surface of Venus, Mercury, Mars, and various asteroids and comets. And he was a mentor to many of us interested in microwave communication. A World War II combat veteran, Pettengill completed his bachelor's degree at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology after the war, then received a doctorate in high energy physics at the University of California, Berkeley. His career in radio astronomy took off when he joined MIT Lincoln Laboratory using the Millstone radar in Westford, Massachusetts for astronomical observations. In 1963, he moved to the newly opened Arecibo Observatory. He was named its director in 1968. In 1977, he was principal investigator of the radar aboard the Pioneer Venus orbiter that created the first near-global topographic map of any planet, and in the 1990s, he was the principal investigator of the Magellan mission to Venus. Pettengill was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1979 and served as director of MIT's Center for Space Research from 1984 until 1989. He received a Guggenheim Fellowship in 1980 and spent his sabbatical at the University of Sydney, Australia. He retired in 1995. He was active on the air until recently. The San Francisco Amateur Radio Club will activate a sailboat on San Francisco Bay as the inaugural event in the Boats on the Air program. The event is set for Saturday, June 5th at 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Inspired by the success of programs like SOTA, POTA, and IOTA, Boats on the Air will feed into the passions of amateur radio and boating. The sailing vessel Aria is a 37-foot-long Beneteau Oceanus with the home port of Sausalito, California. The main rule of boats on the air is that the boat must be underway during the activation. No anchoring, uh, mooring, or tying to a dock is allowed, said Kent Carter, AJ6NI. The plan is for us to be moving 100% under sail power during that time. In addition to being a fun activity, it's hoped that boats on the air will further emergency preparedness and experimentation with amateur radio. Activation frequencies are 7.115 MHz on CW, 14.325 MHz on sideband, 18.100 MHz on FT8, and 146.52 MHz on FM Simplex. For more information or to post your own activation, contact Boats on the Air. Svalbard is a Norwegian archipelago between mainland Norway and the North Pole. It's one of the world's northernmost inhabited areas, and activation by radio amateurs is extremely rare. Concerning the forthcoming major Juliet Whiskey Zero Juliet de-expedition to the area, Ken, Lima Alpha 7, Gulf India Alpha, posted on Facebook that unfortunately two of their operators have had to withdraw for personal reasons, but they have been replaced and so the team should comprise six operators when they depart in July. Going to Prince Carl's Island requires a dedicated, expensive vessel that will transport the team to the island located in the nature reserve on the west coast. The last activation of this island was in 2001. On arrival, the team will make dinghy landings with all equipment. The team plans to focus on North America and Asia outside the IOTA contest, and they will be using all modes, CW, single sideband, and data. 
Their antennas will be vertical directional arrays, and also some verticals at the shore close to the salt water, with an excellent takeoff in all directions. Due to the high risk from polar bears all over the island, the Svalbard activators will have a mandatory 24-7 polar bear watch. They're taking several rifles, flare guns and other protection. Safety is a high priority and all team members are undertaking some training at a local shooting range. The expedition budget is roughly 13,000 US dollars and the team is looking for donations towards the cost of the expensive ship to get them to Svalbard. You can read more about the de-expedition at www.julietwhiskey0whiskey.novemberoscar. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Every year in the spring, folks in the Midwest experience a phenomena I call dead band. The good news is it only lasts for about eight weeks and is gone most every night. Maybe this one has bitten you. Here's what it is. Dead band season is generally, it starts in mid-April and ends in mid-June. Almost every day about 9 o'clock a.m. until about 45 minutes after sunset, we experience very poor band conditions. Power line noise is unusually bad and propagation on most bands is far below average. From AM broadcast to cellular and paging above 1 GHz, everything is below average. While weather may seem to be a factor, this occurs sometimes without regard to the weather. Days with clear skies, low humidity and high winds are usually the worst. I notice it the most in my truck on those days when I get half scale S meter noise readings on 6 meters, 2 meters and 220 from power lines stronger than at any other time of the year. An AM radio station I like to listen to about 45 miles from my home is usually full quieting, is barely hearable during dead band season. My cell phone is functioning well below average during the day and simplex conversations on 220 can take 35 watts to cover only a few miles. What's even weirder than dead band is how it can affect certain regions and leave others untouched. Sometimes I think altitude of the ground may be a factor too. In the early morning hours we can hear tropo skip from 150 miles away, but locally conditions on VHF and UHF are very poor at best. Everybody experiences dead band, but few people talk about trying to identify its cause, then maybe a cure. Do you experience radio conditions in your area like I just described? If so, drop me an email and let me know how it affects your area. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. ARRL East Bay Section Manager Jim Siemens, W6LK, is stepping down because he is relocating to Wyoming. Siemens has served as East Bay Section Manager since July 2018. Mike Patterson, N6JGA, has been appointed to succeed him effective June 1st. Siemens said there really is not a greater honor for a ham like me than to watch so many people get their licenses, learn the code, program a radio for the first time, win some wallpaper, or just enjoy each other's company over a cup of coffee. I get to constantly witness this as section manager. ARRL afforded me the opportunity to have experiences and gain memories that will last me forever. An ARRL Life member, Patterson will serve the balance of Siemens' term, which extends to the end of 2021. His amateur radio background is strong in mentoring, emergency communications, public service, and club leadership. He is a volunteer examiner and the treasurer of the Northern Amateur Relay Council of California, the repeater coordination body for the area that covers about two-thirds of California. Patterson is also on the board of the Pacific Division Annual Convention, Pacificon, active in the local CERT communications group, including trustee of the group's repeater, past president of the Mount Diablo Amateur Radio Club, and a member of several clubs within and outside the section. Patterson has been very active in MDARC's education and training programs and has helped many people to prepare for their first license and upgrade. ARRL Radio Sport and Field Services Manager Bart Janke, W9JJ, made the appointment based on the recommendations of Siemens and the ARRL Pacific Division Director Kristen McIntyre, K6WX. 
As China's Tianwen-1 lander and Zhongrong rover separated over the Martian surface, at least one radio amateur, Edgar Kaiser, DF-2MZ in Germany, was able to note the separation. The vehicle used a combination of a protective capsule, a parachute, and a rocket platform to make the descent. The Tianwen-1 orbiter remains in orbit equipped with a high-resolution camera, a magnetometer, a spectrometer, and a subsurface radar. The lander touched down in Utopia Planitia, a massive impact basin that may have once contained an ocean and is thought to have buried ice. In February, Canadian radio amateur Scott Tilly, VE7TIL, was able to copy the signal from Tianwen-1, which went into orbit around Mars on February 10th. Bletchley Park, which was the heart and soul of code breaking during World War II, has reopened its doors to visitors as pandemic restrictions become less stringent in Great Britain. At the same time, the National Radio Center of the Radio Society of Great Britain, which is located on the historic site, will resume its own array of activities. The National Radio Center reopens daily starting on Friday the 28th of May and will offer demonstrations of amateur radio from the GB3RS station. Visitors may observe operations, but for now will not be permitted into the radio room. The welcome being extended by Bletchley is being delivered cautiously, however, and is following COVID-19 safety guidelines. Visitors are being asked to book their visits in advance by going online and selecting a predetermined time of entry. Beginning on the 7th of June, Bletchley Park will also welcome educational groups who will again be able to make use of on-site resources. For details or to book a visit, visit bletchleypark.org.uk. The San Francisco Amateur Radio Club will activate a sailboat on San Francisco Bay as the inaugural event in the Boats on the Air program. The event is set for Saturday, June 5th at 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Inspired by the success of programs like SOTA, POTA, and IOTA, Boats on the Air will feed into the passions of amateur radio and boating. The sailing vessel Aria is a 37-foot-long Beneteau Oceanus with the home port of Sausalito, California. The main rule of boats on the air is that the boat must be underway during the activation. No anchoring, uh, mooring, or tying to a dock is allowed, said Kent Carter, AJ6NI. The plan is for us to be moving 100% under sail power during that time. In addition to being a fun activity, it's hoped that boats on the air will further emergency preparedness and experimentation with amateur radio. Activation frequencies are 7.115 MHz on CW, 14.325 MHz on sideband, 18.100 MHz on FT8, and 146.52 MHz on FM Simplex. For more information or to post your own activation, contact Boats on the Air. And finally this week, a story many amateurs may find of interest. A recently discovered vintage home movie film provided by New Jersey radio amateur Bob Shank, N2OO, was the highlight of a PBS documentary about the Hindenburg disaster. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, is here with more information on this documentary that many hams may find of interest. The film, shot by his uncle Harold Schenck, may provide clues as to what initiated the disastrous 1937 fire that destroyed the airship Hindenburg and claimed 35 lives as the German Zeppelin was landing at Lakehurst, New Jersey. Harold Schenck tried to interest government investigators in his film, shot from a different angle than newsreel footage that begins only after the fire was well underway, but it was largely overlooked, as Bob Schenck explains in the documentary. The Schenck film is the highlight of the PBS Nova documentary Hindenburg, The New Evidence, that investigates the issue in considerable depth in an effort to unlock the secrets of the cold case. The program aired on May 19th and remains available for streaming. The Nova documentary not only shares Schenck's footage, which provided new clues to re-examine the cause of the explosion, it also reviews scientific experiments that helped investigators come to a fresh understanding of what set off the fire. Bob Shank approached Dan Grossman, an expert on airships, including Hindenburg, in 2012. 
During a commemoration of the disaster that forever memorialized radio reporter Herbert Morrison's plaintiff on-air reaction, Oh, the humanity! The original investigation concluded only that the fire resulted from leaking hydrogen ignited by a spark, but it was never determined just what caused the spark. Witness accounts suggested the fire started near the airship's tail, but supporting evidence was hard to find until the shank footage was examined. The Hindenburg remains vivid in our collective memories all these years later because of the searing images and film of the explosion, said Nova co-executive producer Chris Schmidt in a Manchester Patch article. We feel honored to share this new footage with the world and to bring the Nova audience behind the scenes of this pivotal new investigation into the crash. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on the internet, on low-power FM stations, and on great repeater systems like the WB3GXW repeater on 147.225 MHz in Silver Springs, Maryland, serving all of Silver Springs and also covering the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. WB3GXW can also be found on Echolink conference server node 6154. If you are a This Week in Amateur Radio affiliate and you would like us to give a free on-air announcement of your station's carriage of the program, please send us an email with the station location, call sign, coverage area, and day and time you air This Week in Amateur Radio, plus any other information you would like us to impart. You can send to the following email, w2xbs77 at gmail.com. That address once again is w 2 xbs 77 at gmail.com. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.